Good morning and welcome to the middle of the African bush here on Juma Private Game Reserve. We do apologize for the tech difficulties this morning, but we have been out and about spending time with the incredible Incomas and two Birmingham boys. Lots of activity happening here at the Buffalo Kill. Lots of playing. Uh, the males just chased a female off the carcass and getting a good feed. We are literally surrounded by little lion cubs. And as you can see, there's not much left of that buffalo. Oh, here comes a little horror. He's coming to inspect us by the looks of things. Oh, look at the power of that male. He actually moved the whole carcass. I was quite surprised they didn't drag it into the shade yesterday. And everyone's got full bellies and was feeling a little lazy. Hey, uh, good morning, my name is Brent. I have Dangerous Dave, the objectified dish, on camera today. And uh, we are looking forward to a spectacular sunrise safari. James and Brian are out uh, looking for leopards in another part of the reserve. But for the moment, we're going to sit tight with the Nkahuma pride. Remember, this is a live African safari. You can send us questions by using the hashtag Safari Live or send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Now, we had that incredible dust storm and incredible winds last night, and we'll keep on that curb. Come out a bit, Dave. There's an, uh, to the left. There's a, an attack about to happen. There we go. And there's this cub who's not facing another cub who's looking like stalking. Are you going to do it? Ooh, thinking about it. Nice cool morning, so the cubs are very, very active, uh, playing around, jumping on each other, jumping on mom, even jumping on a Birmingham boy occasionally. See, there we go, there's the stalk. And they're going for, he's going for the little E. There we go, isn't that cute? So that's one of the older cubs and the younger cub. It's difficult to hear all the wonderful sounds this morning due to this bustling wind. The wind has not stopped overnight. And it is a very chilly morning, but that's great for the lions. Oh, look at that. He's pulling the whole carcass over, trying to get to what little meat is left. So, two Birmingham boys here. We did see a third on yesterday's sunset safari, uh, about two kilometers from here. Uh, morning, Jared. Jared says, this is amazing. There are lions everywhere. Indeed, there are. There are five lionesses, eight cubs and two males, 16 in total, spread all around us. Now, while the males will not tolerate uh, generally a female feeding at the same time as them, they are tolerant of the cubs, as we can see, although that cub is more playing with its food than actually eating. It's pretending it caught the buffalo all by itself. Now, Jen is wondering, are all the cubs here? Indeed, they are, Jen, all eight. So from the smallest to the biggest, all the cubs are here. So we are hoping for a bit of sun to break through the clouds. The sun has risen over the eastern horizon. 
and hopefully we're going to be getting some magnificent light on these lines shortly. There's a bit of cloud cover, but it's breaking up quite nicely. So I think we're going to be in for a treat in about 10 to 15 minutes. I think the light's going to be really good. So all those screen shutters out there, get ready. Because I think you're going to get some magnificent screenshots this sun rise safari remember to share your screenshots with us and you can do that by popping them on our facebook page uh, which is safari live or share them on twitter with the hashtag safari live So while we wait for the light to get perfect, uh, Commander Bond is waiting to say good morning. Good morning, good morning everybody, and please excuse the fact that I sound like James Earl Jones during his prime. Uh, my voice was a little bit uh, crackly yesterday, and now it is just very deep. I hope you are all very well today. Hello, Brian. Brian is on camera today. Brian has got a massive case of hay fever on account of the fact that most of the soil in the Lowfield was put into the air by a very, very hard wind yesterday afternoon. My name is James. For those of you who don't know and for those who don't care, I'm so sorry. Uh, our plan today is to head down south. We've had some tracks of Karula already and uh, many of you told or would have seen her on the nest cam at about 20 past 10 yesterday evening. Her tracks came up the Milwaukee drainage towards um, Jumadam. Then we picked them up, we, we picked the tracks going that way. We haven't found them coming back this way. But I wonder if she doesn't have a kill somewhere down here in the drainage system. So that's going to be our general plan today to see if we can't find that. We're as live as Brent is. Sorry about the delay. So please talk to us over the course of the next two hours, three hours. Hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to talk to us on the email. Brian, have I left anything out? Uh, yes. Ah, the thumb. What is the thumb today, Brian? Oh, just a fat tie. A fat tie thumb uh, and possibly in need of some orthodontic work. Yes. Yes. Shame. Good. Okay, eating a apple through a tennis racket, I believe is how we refer to somebody with teeth like that. Let's continue down south towards Twin Dams and we'll see if the Great Queen doesn't pop out. We got very excited on our walk because both Brian and I went for the little wander down the drainage there. There was a great alarm calling of many birds and we thought, ha, here we go, we have struck gold. But it was two African hawk eagles that were flying above, circling for their breakfast trying to get hold of perhaps a Franklin or a guinea fowl or even a unsuspecting um, grey bird. <laughs> Hello Shelley, you say if we don't have any luck with Karula can we do a hyena den drive by? Uh, we can certainly have a look around where those dens are, yeah? Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Shelley. I'm pretty sure they haven't come back. Uh, maybe, but we don't know that a, one of the females, perhaps a low-ranking female, hasn't come back to give birth or something like that. It's always worth having a check. Yeah, so we can definitely have a look at that. Good idea. Good idea. All right, Brenty is still with the lions. Um, let's maximize that time there and go back to see how the cubs rejoice. So there's that wonderful sunrise that I think is going to produce some magnificent light for us shortly. And we are sitting right next to the male while he is busy feasting. So let's have a look. The cubs have moved a little bit further away from us. So there we go. There's the big male. Now for me it's incredible how much the Birminghams have grown in the last year and a half that we've been watching them from almost well, very skinny little teenaged manes to these magnificent beasts we see today. As you can see the light is getting better 
what we will do is we will move shortly, try to get a better view of the Cubs, but let's just focus on the big boy. They seem to have stopped playing a little bit. Ooh, just look at the back quickly. Dave, you see the male furthest away, the Cub is climbing on him, but he's not looking too impressed with him. Oh, mom got a bit worried. Now, oh, Robin says, with all those lines in one place, doesn't the smell of all their defecation become overwhelming? Well, not too bad, Robin, um, but I think probably when it's a bit hotter this, uh, this afternoon, it's going to be quite bad, but it's still worth it because we get to sit with lion cubs. Other Birmingham seems to be sequestering one of the lionesses to the side. So she's probably about to come into Estrus and that's why he's doing it. But let's uh, move around and see what's happening on that side of the sighting. So remember, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. If you'd love to know anything about these incredible lions, what they've been up to, a bit of their history, and what they might get up to today. Watch your head there, Dave. Oh, there's the missing line. I wondered where she was. I think she's just coming back from Sydney's waterhole. She went to have a drink, and there she's popped out. Now, there's some interesting dynamics happening at the moment. And if we look here, so we've got this lioness, and... Uh, the one at Birmingham to the left, and he's not letting her anywhere near the other male. So she's probably about to come into Estrus. Oh, there we go. You can hear this lioness who's walking and calling. Oh, get ready. I think it's going to be a cub attack. Hello, Mom. Miss Jamma. It's just too sweet. Lovely little greeting. As I said, I think she went off to have a drink at the water hole. Isn't that just lovely? just going to focus on this wonderful interaction between 
the lioness and the cubs at the moment and the wonderful audio that they're providing, those incredible noises the cubs make. There's a little argument about milk there that caused that all those noises. <laughs> Serious complaints going on. See, look at this, as that female gets up, that male is trying to shepherd her. Now, if she's making her way towards the carcass, he's gonna charge at the other male more than likely. Let's just get in a position where we can see that, if it does happen. Oh dear. Um, so we're going to have to go across to James. I've got a flat tire and I need to get out of here before the tire gets too flat. And uh, I have to change the tire right next to Lions. Um, so I'm going to just make my way out of here quickly and then I'll be back in a, in a few minutes and we're just going to change the tire very quickly. So let's go across to James. Well, that is not ideal at all to have a flat tyre and a lion sighting, is it, Brian? No, it is not. We have found absolutely nothing since we last saw you. We did see a few more tracks, but we think they may well have been the tracks that we found the end of towards the pan. So we're sort of just looking around here in these drainage systems to see if there isn't an antelope hanging from a tree or something. Uh, otherwise, any heartbeat would be much appreciated. Hello, Ali. You say that we, you say that we say that we walk around on foot, and are we not afraid that the animals are going to stalk us for their breakfast? Um, Ali, the temptation, of course, is to answer you in a in a fairly flippant manner and say that no, the animals have had their breakfast already. Ali, we are not afraid of being stalked by the animals because we know how they perceive us. As human beings, they see us as a predator, so they are, by and large, very afraid of us. So that is why you can walk around here relatively safely, and you're, the chances, if you are going to come to harm, it's going to be because you've cornered an animal, and it feels so afraid of you that it cannot get away, and so it's going to attack. So even something like a buffalo or an elephant will move away from you, if it can, rather than attack. I think for many people the thought of being out here on foot and the thought of predators, perhaps lions and leopards, is the most scary thing for them. But they gen almost universally see us as frightening and they'll move away. 
and as long as you're able to pick up the signs that they give you so for example if you see a leopard and it growls or a lion and it growls at you and you move away then you'll be fine if you don't pick up on those signs or don't pick up on say some alarm calls of birds in some thick bush and realize that the tracks leading in there could perhaps be leading to I don't know a lioness on cubs or something like that then you can get yourself into trouble so the training we do is very crucial um, and very uh, important to keeping us safe when we are out on foot but yes it is actually relatively safe if you know what you're doing out here to be on foot good question now that there on this tree was made by a heartbeat fortunately where that heartbeat I don't is I don't know you can just see how the top of the tree I would get out and show you but I can't actually reach it that is a good what Brian seven feet at the top there probably nine feet off the ground and that is mud that has been rubbed there by only one animal a large elephant has sprayed mud on himself and come and scratched his skin against this old knobthorn tree in fact it's an old leadwood I think isn't that great nine feet tall at the shoulder everyone that's an enormous animal that's three feet taller than Brian at the shoulder. It is. Brian, that's very large. Mm, much larger than me. All righty. <laughs> Quite a nice dawn chorus this morning. Couple of Franklins going. But uh, not very loud. And uh, not very uh, sort of um, numerous on the animal front. But it is gorgeous. The light is particularly gorgeous because the cloud is dispersing it. Um, amazing storm we had yesterday. Well, not rainstorm, sort of wind and, and sandstorm. Ah, there's our first heartbeat. No. No. Hello, Birdie from Georgia. What an appropriate question you have for your name. You say, how many species of birds do we normally see on a drive or per day? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I've never counted them. But birdie, I reckon you could probably see if you really tried, you could see an average of 50 species a day, at least. There is total bird list, including vagrants, which are animals that just come in, at least birds that fly in very briefly, so they're blown in on a storm, or maybe there's a year where there's uh, massive rains, and so you get odd birds coming in here, and they would be classed as vagrants. Um, you get a total bird list here of about 250 species. So that's pretty good. But on the birding big day, so that's the 24 hour period. Um, the, sorry, I thought I saw a twack, but I didn't. The birding big day is a day where you go out and you, you know, well, you can go as far and wide as you like, but you see how many species you can get in one day. And we used to do it, I think it's in November, we used to do it at Ngala, where I used to work just to the north of us. And on that particular, I think, the top, what was the highest we got one day? This is with some pretty good birders on one reserve in summer. I think the highest we ever got was about 150 or 160 species. So that's, you know, just shows you that the other 100 are they're just not very common so I would say an average birdie of about 50 a day if you really put your mind to it in the middle of the summer and that's all you do and you look for every single bird you can probably get about 160 birds in a 24 hour period which is not bad going I think the United Kingdom has a total bird list of about 10 Not sure what Australia is. I'd love to know what's Australia's total bird. The South Africa has a total bird population of about 950. Um, the Kruger Park, you can see about just over 500. And in this area, about 250 if you're really lucky. I'd love to know what the Australian bird list count is. What you got? Ah, Jimlogene in the tree. Well spotted, Brian. Brian leapt out of his seat like a scalded cat. That gymnogene is trying to filch some kind of nestling out of a hole, I think. Let's sneak forward. Maybe a squirrel. Don't want to frighten it. There it goes. 
The light is just very horrible there. How's that, Brian? Beautiful. So that is an African Harrier Hawk or Gymnogene. Listen to the birds calling, robins mainly. It hasn't actually got something, no. It's looking. Now, normally it is filching nestling birds out of tree holes, but at this time of the year, not many birds are nesting. So it's probably likely to be squirrels, maybe lizards, maybe the old snake that's coiled up inside one of the holes. Hmm. Is he gone? No, he's there. It's an impressive bird, that. I'm going to sneak forward. He's probably about two and a, two and a bit feet tall. I'm sure this is the same chap that was eating terrapins the other day at Biffleshook Dam. It's so close by. I think we might get a really nice view if he doesn't fly off. Yeah, he's just he's just searching in every single hole on this tree. How's that, bro? So that is the African Harrier Hawk. Let me just quickly... Oh, just listen to this, the bird song this morning, isn't it lovely? There he goes. He likes to be behind the sun, doesn't he? It also eats eggs, believe it or not. But it will basically eat anything. Small mammals, reptiles, frogs, insects, anything it can. And of course the factoid that everyone will tell you about a gymnogene or African harrier hawk is the fact that it has a double jointed intertarsus. There he goes. Oh! <laughs> now, the tarsal joint, of course, I suppose you might look at the leg and say, oh, that's the knee, but it isn't actually. It's actually the equivalent of your ankle joint. That intertarsal joint, and it can bend both ways. So you imagine you had an ankle that could bend frontwards and backwards. Oh, listen. Did you hear that? Listen, 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 it's calling. How's that? I don't think I've ever heard that before. Just see it there. I'm going to sneak forward. Do you see it there, bro? Uh, no. Hello, Bob in Australia. Thank you very much for your answer. You say that Australia has a total species list of just over 900, including including vagrants. It's in that Balanites tree. Somewhere. I think in the middle there. Just sit and listen, it's in there somewhere. There. I don't think it's in the picture there, I'm not sure. Oh, there it is, yeah. You just see the bright red face, yeah, look at that. <laughs> Brilliant. It's 
So it flushes that pinkish colour during social interaction or during breeding season, possibly also during stressful times. But the face is normally yellow. Hello Marianne and Texas. You want to know why we look at this raptor? Uh, you want to know what the biggest raptor in this area is? Well, this one is just over two feet tall and has a wingspan. I'll just check what the wingspan is for you quickly. Doesn't actually say what the wingspan is. It's probably about the same. Um, well, no, but more than two feet. It's probably got a wingspan of about four and a half feet. The biggest raptor that we get out here is surprisingly not the Marshall Eagle, which I'm sure many of you perhaps thought it was. The biggest raptor we get here is something called the Cape Vulture. Now the Cape Vulture uh, is not commonly seen here. It breeds up in the uh, it breeds up in the mountains just behind Hoodsprite there. And it is more than three and a half feet tall. It's just over a meter tall. Sorry, just under three and a half feet tall. And weighs about nine kilograms. So that is a massive, massive bird. I'll just try and find its wingspan. is 2.55 meters, which is in feet. What's that, Brian? It's about seven and a half feet. It's about seven and a half feet. Seven and a half feet at the wingspan. And then the second biggest is probably the leopard faced vulture, um, which is pretty much the same size actually. But apparently, individuals of the Cape vulture have been found that are bigger than the white backed. And it's a, bit, it's a bit shorter. It's a bit shorter, a bit lighter, but has a slightly longer wingspan than the, than the Cape vulture. Amazing. In fact, it's got a wingspan of um, 2.8 meters. I mean, that is massive. That is it's almost a full foot longer. It's almost 8 feet. So, leopard faced vulture and cape vulture would be the two that compete for the largest m raptor in this area. I'm going to carry on towards Bifflesook Dam. Um, well, I'll just go forward and turn. Oh, there we go. The same one. Ha! <laughs> How's this? This is amazing. Laura, you're absolutely right. You say there that it's fascinating that his face is not flushing red and yellow. That it is staying yellow, uh, red, and you say it must be full breeding season. I think that's exactly what's going on here, and I think that's exactly why he was calling like he was. Just go around the corner here. <clears throat> There's a nyala just underneath the gymno gene. That's nice, isn't it? Might have to try and take a picture, Brian. Uh, he's trying to find something in a hole there to eat. Now, there's a nest of Jim the nest or a Harrier Hawk nest uh, on a road not far from here, also in a big Balanites tree. And I just wonder if they haven't decided to move home for some reason. That call is quite something. <laughs> I 
Shelly, you say to these birds hunt snakes. They will eat snakes, yes, happily eat snakes. They'll basically eat anything they can catch, but their special adaptation, Shelly, is to catch animals that, or birds especially, that live inside tree holes. Because they've got very, very flexible legs or tarsals, ankle joints, which allow them to reach into tree holes. So if you can imagine putting your arm into a hole from the top and obviously you wouldn't be able to bend it up and down, you'd only be able to bend it one way. If you're a gymnogene, it can bend both ways. Very red face, not just the sort of pinky colour, it's properly red. So I'm sure it's breeding season. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. And you can hear all the other birds have gone completely silent around here. All you can hear is the rustling of the wind at the moment and the groaning of the car, obviously. Straight over the top of us again, and into the sun. How very marvellous, Brian. Mm. Wasn't that nice? That was fantastic. Hey. Okay. Just continue on our way. I think we're going to do a beef pass over Biffleshook Dam, see what we can find there. Maybe Kurula. Right. Brent Leo Smith. Unlike the um, pit crew of the Mercedes Formula One team, has managed to change his tyre, but it did take longer than se seven seconds, and the cats have gone to sleep in the meantime, so let's go and have a look at them. Yes, we do apologise, but driving off-road, we do get flat tyres from time to time, so <laughs> rather than have a completely flat tyre, within four meters of the line, we decided it was more sensible to dash to safety, change the tire and then come back. And unfortunately yet, everyone's gone to do do while we've been gone, except one male line still on the carcass. When we will move a little bit later, there he is. So he's still eating, but literally the rest of the pride are fast asleep. Well, I know it wasn't quite seven seconds, but I do feel Dave and I did a, a very good job. I think it was under, un, under five minutes. And uh, unlike the Mercedes pit crew, uh, whose wheels are very close to the ground, I suppose, or so ours, but ooh, he's pulling the carcass. And unlike the Mercedes pit crew, I think who those wheels are specially designed to weigh about half a kilogram, and these big heavy stainless steel rims and stuff that we have uh, tend to weigh a little more. But we got our morning gym. Oh, it looks like he's got into a position he's happy with again, and if we move around we can see lots of sleeping lions if you've got the two two of the lionesses fast asleep in front of us here and then just to the left of them it's the birmingham who's got i can't see which lioness it is who's using a piece of elephant dung as a pillow presently look at that <laughs> look at that see that she looks very comfortable on that piece of elephant dung and the birmingham who's following her every move. <laughs> so it's not Amber. So it must be the... Uh, this, what was the, the, the baby of the last litter, so this uh, sub-adult who's now a full adult lioness. And uh, 
So if she does have cubs, it'll be her first litter. And hopefully that does come in. The Birmingham boy is Mr. Split Lip. And now if we have a look at his lip, and you can see the remnants of that wound, and it has healed incredibly well. And probably, oh, it's, it's actually this this work cycle, so not even that long ago, that was quite the gaping wound. I'm just going to see if I can find it. There we go. There we go. That's what it looked like less than less than three weeks ago. So you can see that split there, and you can see how quickly it's healed. Oh, Dave. Look at that. Incredible power of a male line. Amazing how strong male lions are. And he just dragged that whole carcass without even trying. said not much left quite a lot of skin still but there is meat underneath it and that's what he's after Andrew is wondering how much lions eat well Andrew they're able to gorge themselves in a single sitting eating about 60 pounds of meat but on average if we take all the kills they make in a month they eat about 14 pounds a day So when he moves and drags that carcass around, it's just to get to some bits of meat that are left. William is wondering, at what age does a male lion's mane start showing? Well, you can actually see it when they're about seven or eight months, they start getting really fluffy around the neck. But I mean, you can, just from physically the size compared to the female cubs, you can see it from earlier on. But I'd say, oof, really fully developed mane's only about, five to six years old this age that you're looking at now their manes have developed incredibly over the last year oh 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 now she looks like she wants to go back to the carcass but if she does that there could be some interesting interaction between the males so get ready he might, might be a bit of a male lion fight shortly. Can you hear the growling? Oh, sorry, my head's in the way. Ah, but she's decided just not to get there. But the growling started immediately from the male on the carcass as soon as the other male came closer. But she's been slowly working her way towards the carcass. But while we watch what's playing out with the line dynamics, James has got a great big grey beast. I bet you thought it was an elephant, everybody, but it isn't. It's a hippopotamus, and it's just come out of this... I nearly used the term water, but uh, for what it's just come out of, water is an inappropriate description. It's just come out of this sort of mud the last remaining moisture here at Bivelshoek Dam 
I don't really know why it's walking off. It had got up already by the time we got here, and so obviously he's decided that he's a bit hungry still, and perhaps he's going to go and look for something to eat. And the hippopotamus at this time of the year is going to have to walk a long way to find sufficient nutrition. Because as you can see where he's walking, there is no grass whatsoever. And I don't think, if I'm not mistaken, I mean the hippo will really struggle to, um, to browse. They just don't have the mouth or teeth structure for it. Poor fellow. Really, this is a very difficult time for Hippo. And I had a message from Sam Chevalier the other day, who many of you will remember. And he'd just gone into the Kruger around the Satara area, which is north of us. And he says there are Hippo carcasses all over the place. And that's brought on by the drought, of course. So eventually these little habitats, if we don't get rain soon, will run out. Then unfortunately that is what happens. As Brent was saying yesterday, I was listening to him on Drive, and it was um, an interesting comment he made about the fact that Hippo will probably not, if they can find sufficient shade, they can get through a dry season. But it's food that is the limiting factor. They've got to find enough grazing. And you can see that chap is going to struggle to find enough grazing there for himself to eat. He's also, quite interestingly, come out of the water in the middle of the day. And, well, I'm quite pleased that Brian and I weren't walking around there early this morning. Brian is nodding vigorously. Because a hippopotamus is the very last thing you want to come across on foot in the bush. Okay, let's go back to Brent and the lions. We'll continue our search. So we've had a swap over of males. So the second male. Oh, oh, look at this. This is going to cause something. Get ready, guys. So she's immediately gone to flirt with the male who was feeding, who the other male has been protecting her from. So I'm just putting my head down. Now there's growling. There could be a bit of pandemonium shortly. As soon as that male started feeding, she's like, yes, escape. So you see everyone's up and about in the sense that there's a, a potential for pandemonium. Okay, it all seems to be calming down again. And here he comes. Okay, so status quo seems to have been reached again. Now, a huge welcome to Rosanna in New Zealand, who is a new viewer. Welcome to Safari Live, Rosanna. Now, Rosanna is wondering how many times in a year will a lioness come into estrus. Now, that is very dependent, Rosanna, on what's going on. If they've got cubs, they will take those cubs through to adulthood, which is about three, uh, three years old before they come into estrus again. Uh, but if the cubs are killed, they'll come into estrus within two weeks. So they are able to come into estrus frequently. Their gestation periods are also very short, only about well, 90 to 110 days. Uh, so they are able to produce cubs quite quickly if they lose cubs. Oh, let's see what happens here now. There's one of the lionesses heading towards the carcass. Now, will the male decide just because someone else is eating, they want it? He's lifted his head, he's thinking about it. No, it doesn't look too... Too stressful. Well, there we go. And you can see they've got lots of big fat bellies. This cool weather will definitely suit them. 
as it gets warmer during the day, the lions will become less and less active as they need to digest. And they have quite a, quite a lot of trouble dispelling heat. They're unable to sweat like us, so they have to pant and lie in the shade. Hi, Susan from Georgia, who's another new viewer. Susan says, at what age will the cubs start eating meat? They seemed curious about the carcass yesterday, uh, but not really that curious about the meat. Susan, all these cubs are eating meat. They can eat meat from about six weeks old. Uh, the problem is that they're so fat at the moment, and they're coupling the meat with mother's milk, that they're not as entertained by the carcass. But when this kill was first made, when James came here yesterday, Sunray Safari, they had been stuck in, they were apparently covered in blood. But you can see why they've got multiple sources of food. There they are, suckling on mom. Well, not all of them, but one of the nice things about being in a pride, and also in a pride where there's quite a few cubs of the same age, a lion's practice aloe suckling. What this means is that the fe all the females who have cubs will suckle the other females' cubs. It's a one way to ensure if maybe one female is not producing as much milk that the cubs will still be cared for. Now there's some very interesting studies going on at the moment that seem to, to, seem to lead towards the fact that uh, lions will almost sync their estrus cycles or have estrus cycles very close to each other, uh, the females and the pride. So they are able to practice aloe suckling. So there can be multiple females all producing milk when the cubs are at a milk drinking age. Now they're only weaned at about six months, but they become less and less dependent on milk after about three months, three and a half months, four months maybe. But at the moment they still are very dependent on milk. I think the oldest cubs are probably coming Close to four months now. Oh, here come the the Battalier squad. And vultures. Vultures pulling. There we go, here come the vultures. Well, just, just beyond our view, you can see there at the top of the screen, just behind the bushes, there's a vulture sitting on top of a dead branch. Now, Jen B is wondering, will a nursing lioness need to drink more water than one that's lactating? No, not necessarily, Jen. They need to eat more meat and drink more blood. And that's what helps them. Oh, there we are. Upset. Cubs are getting a little bit feisty on the teats. Now, the thing that woke those lions up was the arrival of vultures. Vultures, lions do not like vultures. Uh, they will chase them if they come on the ground anywhere near their kills. Now see, the one who stood up, now all, there's about five or six little <laughs> cubs all trying to feed on four teeth, so this could be quite noisy. There's one taking it right. Well, if mom's standing up, doesn't mean I can't have a drink. 
bit more difficult, but I will try. Oh, oh there we go. Hi, Ma. We can hear. Oh, there we go. Too much fighting. Other moms up. Enough of this nonsense, little ones. Must share. So you can see that lioness, that one there. You can see how her ears are going a bit flat. She's getting a little bit irritated with the clubs. She might snap at them. Tell them to behave. I do think everything is going to settle down again around the Inkahumas. We'll just see what happens, but we're probably going to move out, let some other people come in here. Just, we will try and maybe come back before the end of the safari. So we're going to leave the Inkahumas to enjoy their nice cold windy morning and see what else we can find out here. While we do that, uh, let's go see what James has been up to. We've driven away from Biffleshook Dam, everybody, and there we found a herd of impala. <clears throat> this isn't the first herd of impala we found. I know Brian and I have found two herds of impala. Such is our immense skill. The first herd had some youngsters in it, at least some older females in it. This one's got some youngsters in it. And they all looked to me like they were starting to show how pregnant they are. Uh, I think the fluffiness brought on by the cold has also probably added to their size but they also are starting to show a little bit and they're all just a little bit nervous now because of the wind but the light is just absolutely gorgeous isn't it but you can see how they are basically in a state of shock all the time they're basically terrified all the time and I think it was Brian and oh it's a warthog there that's frightened them see that that's why they got nervous. The pig or hog obviously came out from somewhere and gave them a fright. Let's go back a bit. Brian and I were discussing the other day about whether they actually feel afraid. Hello, Laurie. I'd love to show you an impala lily, but I don't know where any are. This is, of course, the right time of the year to find flowering impala lilies. So I'll keep an eye out. An impala lily, everybody, is sort of semi-succulent plant with a beautiful candy-striped sort of pink and yellow flower. It's beautiful. There's the pig as well. You see the pig looking at us, Brian? No, I don't. See the Peltoforum bush? Mm -hmm. To the right, underneath. It's very well hidden. That big Peltoforum tree. Yeah. Uh, no, you probably can't. And I was just sorry, just back to the sort of fear thing. I've I've read various bits and pieces about whether or not they are sort of in a constant state of shock, and some say they are, and some say they aren't. But you can imagine, in order to stay alive out here, you've got to be pretty much on the edge of an adrenaline rush all the time. 
And then we had a discussion with some viewers the other day who asked about post-traumatic stress disorder and whether the animals out here suffer from it. And I don't think they do, you know. I think that they have obviously evolved to live in this environment where they are on constant threat. And if you're an impala, you are flavor of the month for lions and leopards and cheetahs and wild dogs and just about everything else. And so um, you don't necessarily feel... Uh, you you know, you, you you never know anything different. And so I have no doubt they produce an astonishing amount of adrenaline during the course of their lives. But at the same time, their bodies, <coughs> their adrenal glands, and their, I think it's, is it cortisol? is the hormone that deals with adrenaline in the body. I think they probably produce much more than we do, for example, and therefore they can cope with it. Now the human being, post-traumatic stress disorder is brought about by stress or trauma that is not within the natural ambit of our lives or our experience. So if you think of those poor souls in the trenches in the First World War and the amount of post-traumatic stress disorder they experienced or anybody who's been in a conflict um, where bullets have been whizzing over your heads and you've watched people dying um, that's not the natural order of things and so it's not surprising that human beings have that post-traumatic stress problem because these impala of course in the same way that their diet doesn't make them sick in the same way that their lifestyle doesn't make them sick this is how they've lived for millions of years and it's only we as human beings that have with our modified lifestyles and our super uber stress that have created situations like PSTD, cancers, I think, diabetes, and all kinds of forms of mental illness. So our bodies have just not biologically adapted yet, perhaps, to the lifestyles that we've made for ourselves. Rashi, that's a very nice shot there, Brian, of a young... Impala ram, but what's really interesting to me is that that Impala ram, everybody, you would expect him, he's quite, he's actually really interesting. Those horns are not the horns of a yearling. Now, most of the Impala here are going to be yearlings by the time we hit November. That is just two short, two and a bit short months away, and I think that is an Impala born in February. I think that's a February baby. Just in the background, you can hear some drongos going yep, 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 singing this wind. You can also, I'm sure, hear rushing over the microphone. Whoosh. Strange weather. All righty, well done, Brian. Good job. Lovely impala sighting. Let's move on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See if we can find an impala lily for Laura. <laughs> I once had a girlfriend called Laura, believe it or not, and I have an impala lily story about her. We went <laughs> for a walk one evening. I was working down in the south of this area, and she wanted an impala lily, so I said, Well, I know where there are some, so we come for a walk and yeah, I was wooing her at this, that stage, and so I went. We went out, and I mean, you're not really allowed to harvest wild flowers from the bush. <laughs> I, I cut, cut one. Now we found them, and I took a piece, and we didn't really know how they, were, how if they would grow. She turned out to be an utterly horrific um, gardener. It's another story. Anyway. We walked back into camp, and as we came back into camp, the owners came around the corner. They were about to go on a game drive. And um, I was struck by that sense of not knowing what to do, of awkwardness, where you know you've been cuffed doing something you perhaps shouldn't have, but is it serious enough to actually worry about, and would the owners worry about it? And I had this thing now behind my back, and I've no, I, no doubt in my mind they knew exactly what was going on, 
that I was wooing this young girl with um, an impala lily that I'd filched from a clearing on their land. And I think they found it very, very amusing to see my discomfort. Anyway, the impala lily died shortly thereafter on account of neglect from Laura. It's a good harbinger for how our relationship was going to go. Right, on we go to find some animals. Ooh, there's a diker. Can you believe it? Oh, the diker is running away. Because dikers are born of yellow livers. They are not brave around vehicles. Lucy, you're wondering about buffalo and why it is that we haven't seen... Why it is, that, sorry, that we haven't seen any breeding herds of buffalo of late. Lucy, you wonder if it's got to do with the drought. I think you're absolutely correct, it has to do with the drought. The water here on Juma is now fairly finished and I think you'll find that the big herds of buffalo that sometimes come through here and are concentrating... Oh, come on, bird! There it is. With this lens we can get it. It's a red-billed buffalo weaver. Really nice shot of a red-billed buffalo weaver there. You can see it's very nice red bill, you see. So, Lucy, I think you'll find that because the water is that much more concentrated in places away from Juma, that's where they're mainly going. So they do pop through here every so often for a bit of a graze, but then they'll disappear again. And here's something alarming on the ground. It was a helmet trike, but there are a couple of doves there, so I don't think it's alarming. It's anything particularly alarm-worthy. E.g. Karula and her two cubs. I'm beginning to think she doesn't like me anymore, you know. I haven't seen her babies for some time. I'd really hoped when we saw that shot of her coming up towards the nest cam, I thought maybe we'd be lucky this morning. We might still be. In the meantime, let's go back to Brent, find out what he is tracking and where he is tracking it. So there's a report of male leopard tracks heading towards Triple M. So what we're going to do is we're going to hedge all our bets. We're going to start right up at the gate and work our way south, see if those leopard tracks have crossed out of Juma. If they haven't, we'll follow them to Arathusa. If they haven't, we'll loop back and see if we can find where that leopard is hiding on Juma. Now, there is a very strong chance that that leopard is sitting pretty on a kill in a tree somewhere. This windy weather and that dust storm last night are ideal big cat hunting weather. So if we don't find any tracks crossing, there's a very good chance that that male leopard has got a kill and is sitting somewhere in the block in between the access road and Impala Plains. We're just going to double check that he hasn't crossed Triple M first. Okay, we are on Triple M, it's time to start looking for tracks, always a good spot to start, for some reason this seems to be a highway for leopards uh, into Sibambili, but oh joyous day, no tracks crossing. Oof, it's still quite nippy, I've been quite lucky, we've been sitting quite still with the lions, but now uh, the wind is still up, which is going to make a lot of there animals like the Impala just, James just had, a little bit jumpy. Oof, chilly, now to zip up. Now it is 
always great because you never know what you're going to see, but also you never know what type of weather you're going to experience. And being out every day, we get to experience weather in all its facets. And last night, uh, we had a first for me in the Sabi Sands, and it sounds like since our viewers have been watching, a first for them as well. We had this incredible dust storm that just marched in from the, the southwest, and it almost looked like a monsoon rain coming towards us. But it turned out to be a wall of sand that got stuck between my teeth, uh, and it got stuck between my eyelashes. Uh, and uh, when I washed my hair last night, there was a definite uh, brown color that came out of it. So uh, I'm happy that the dust storm is over. It was quite something to behold and created an absolutely spectacular sky. What's that in the road down there? Impala. Oh, what's beyond the Impala? That's the question. A diker. <laughs> well, it's always worth, if you see a spot of movement in the distance, especially on a road like this, it's always worth grabbing the binos, having a double check, because it could be a leopard slinking across. We're going to go very, very slowly through here. Uh, it is quite a busy road, but what we're hoping, if the tracks do cross, that they're going to cross in the soft bits, soft bits on the edge where people haven't driven. Now, because of that really strong wind at, this, at sunset and going through to about 9 o'clock last night, there's a big chance uh, that those tracks from that time of the day will be very, very... Sorry, what have we got here? One track, two track. Ah, it's lions heading straight towards the carcass. They might have come here. There is a pan here for a drink. And it's about equidistant from, uh, oh, actually, I think Sydney's water hole's a bit closer. But maybe there might have been elephants or something there that would have stopped them drinking. So they might have come here for a drink. Hello, morning glory. Thank you very much for that update uh, about Tengana, the dominant male leopard on Juma. He came and had a drink on the Juma Dam Cam uh, at about 10 o'clock last night, rolled in some buffalo feces and then continued on his merry way. Now, the unfortunate thing about Mr. Tengana, as we know, he is a marcher and he can walk through the whole of Juma in an evening. So let's hope he got sidetracked by something to eat before he disappears uh, to the west. So that's almost certainly the male leopard tracks we're looking for at the moment. And hopefully we do not find them crossing this road. Now, Lissa said, because of that incredible sandstorm we had on the Sunset Safari yesterday, is it going to make tracking a little bit more difficult today? Uh, yes and no. So any tracks that are not 100% fresh will have that lovely, or not lovely, but a fine layer of dust across. I mean, the wind is blowing, but it's not blowing to the same effect as it was last night. So there's still a good chance um, that if the tracks are fresh from this morning, they're going to be much more clear than the, the tracks from last night. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, so yes and no. As long as well, the wind is still blowing enough to cover the tracks, but I'm hoping they'll be far more prominent uh, than a track from yesterday. Now, one of Tingana's favorite routes is to go through here and head towards Red Dam. Unless, of course, as I say, he's managed to catch something. 
then there's a very strong, and with the weather last night, there's a very strong possibility that he is on Juma with the kill because of the weather. Now, as our little impala scuttle off in the wind, James has got a slightly larger antelope to show you. It's not very large, everybody. It's quite a little fellow, really. It's just a little nyala. A little nyala cow with her slightly larger nyala mum and a nyala sibling and a nyala male, possibly father. Mm, unlikely, though. There he is. It's actually interesting. I think amongst the antelope, I think it's most common that you find the nyala bull with the rest of the family. And I wonder if there isn't something slightly more nuclear around the social interactions of impala, at least of nyala, than the, perhaps the other antelope species that we get out here. Now, many of you will hear us say nyala bull and nyala cow or you. And it's at this size of antelope that the designation changes. There's absolutely no biological reason for it whatsoever, but this just seems to be about the size. So anything smaller than a nyala, you've got a lamb and a ewe and a ram. Anything bigger than a nyala, you've got a bull, a cow and a calf. Yeah. Did you see how fascinating that nyala finds this, Brian? Chewing on that little piece of grass which is quite impressive for a browser. So obviously doing a bit of mixed feeding at the moment. Hmm. And you can hear maybe in the trees the rustling of this wind. And then they are very comfortable here. They'll just stick along the, in the sort of sheltered spots along these little tributaries of the great Luamati drainage, enjoying the shelter offered by them. It seems the leaves aren't even moving at all, with the nyala of feeding. Very nice. Alrighty, let's continue. We're going down the riverbed. I'm heading towards my currently favorite jackalberry tree. It is my favorite jackalberry tree simply on account of the fact that it has so many jackalberries in it and therefore it has quite a lot going on. We've had many things in there, many birds and often monkeys and we had some baboons there the other day which oh, is always hilarious. Watching baboons is like watching a natural sort of Monty Python skit. They're always doing utterly outlandish things to or with each other and I suppose they're so funny because they are so very human. just can't believe how lovely the light is. Yesterday the light was so harsh at the beginning of the drive and it's just delightful now. Interspersed with the grey The car's not driving itself like it's supposed to, Brian. No, no. I nearly had an accident. I'm sorry about that, Brian. Will you forgive me? No. No. Uh, uh, never. Oh. Oh, well. Hmm, very good question. Sandy, yes, um, this is the short answer to your question. The, Sandy's question, everybody, is a good one. She says, we're not afraid of the animals on foot, but what happens if you get too close to a predator and they start to get completely used to you? and they will start to not react to you on foot and they become completely comfortable. Do they become a danger and will they then be removed? 
Um, Sandy, you know what, what it happens with, that does sometimes happen, is with young male leopards. Young male leopards become completely um, comfortable around human beings on foot, especially just when they go independent. And I don't know if you remember when Sindila was being left for a long time, often we'd walk into the area where he was and he would just sit and watch us and then he'd approach us and I remember when Jamie just first arrived here she turned around once after having found him on foot and he would just he was walking up behind her having a look he wasn't stalking her he was just having a look um, but what you find Sandy is that when they get older as soon as they hit puberty that leaves that kind of um, comfort around people dissipates and they become wild again and so it really doesn't happen very often I mean you do hear the odd story but it's very unusual for an animal that once it hits adulthood that it feels that level of comfort around human beings another great example the hyenas you've seen those hyenas come underneath the car biting the tires but once they hit sort of six months of age they stop doing that they'll come towards the cars they'll have a look a little bit and then they move away again they don't come up to the cars, they don't sniff anymore, they're not curious anymore and so that's the kind of thing that sort of happens but you do, you've got to watch it, absolutely and I mean there are parts of this particular reserve where you know you can walk up to lions and they just won't react to you they'll just, I mean Herbert was telling me the story of a lioness who he used to track who he found with cubs the cubs were playing and he didn't see her until it was too late and she stuck her head up out of a bush and he thought well now I'm in for it because she's gonna charge me and he looked she looked re recognized that it was a human being I doubt she recognized who it was and she put her head down and went back to sleep with her cubs playing all around her so that's okay but you do then Sandy get into the stage sometimes where the animal now thinks that's not a threat so perhaps it's a meal and that particularly happens with an older animal or a sick animal that will then try its luck it's very unusual though but normally when an adult reaches adulthood they lose their sort of curiosity and that wildness reinstills and the relationship will drift again so if you've had a relationship with a male leopard on foot before as a youngster that drifts away as soon as they hit puberty and they become territorial nice question that Sheila, I haven't forgotten about the hyena dens. I did check the one off Leadwood a few days ago, so I'm not going to go to that one. I will happily go, we'll go towards Treehouse Dam after this, and we'll go towards the two dens near there. <clears throat> there's one on Philemon's dip, or on Philemon's cut line, and there's another one just off Zoe's Road. We'll go and have a look at those two. I was also rather hoping for a spectacular brown hooded kingfisher sighting here. We've had some good ones of late and they come and they sit at sort of eye level and I've yet to get a good picture of them but nothing like that and no Garuda I still think she is just south of Juma Dam uh, on a kill somewhere oh <laughs> Brian You'll see the diker there. It's just straight on the edge of the bank there. I thought it was a leopard when I first saw it. Hello Herb. Herb, you say that I have made mention of the fact that some ground dwelling birds don't go and roost in trees at night because they don't have opposable claws. Herb, uh, you, you've made mention of the fact that guinea fowl, where you grew up, uh, used to go and do that to avoid the foxes. Um, Herb, many, many ground operating birds will absolutely roost in trees, and guinea fowl are one of them. Guinea fowl do have opposing toes, they've got a back foot. I was talking specifically about the courses and the lapwings. The courses and the lapwings only have three front facing toes they have no back toe at all so they cannot grip in the same way that a guinea fowl or a frankton frankton will sit in trees often in fact they roost in trees it's only the the the, the lap wings and the courses that cannot go up into trees and perch there they could go and stand in trees absolutely but I don't think they could sleep in trees but Franklin's and the guinea fowl absolutely can yeah thank you for that herb
Frank, both Franklins and guinea fowl, of course. Oh, there's a monkey. Straight up above us. In the leadwood tree. Hello, monkey. You shall see him, Brian. I think he's hiding. There it is. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Young monkey, almost impossible to tell what sex it is from this range. I'm just wondering why he seems to be on his own. It seems a little bit odd to me. Not so, Brian. Well, we're not far from our big jackalbee tree, so let's pop down there and have a look. What's going on there? And look at this magnificent thing here as we go past. It's called a Scotia brachypatella or weeping boar bean. And there are more monkeys in the top of it. I think it's a magnificent tree. You see the monkeys? There they sit, huddled. What was that? I thought I may have heard the crunch crunch of bones, but I, I don't think I did. I think these monkeys would be going ballistic if there was a predator under here somewhere. Sorry, you say this monkey is showing me some attitude. Well, uh, monkeys seldom do anything else. They are very cheeky things. And it's one of the main reasons that you've got to be so careful. It's got to be, you've got to be so careful about feeding them and about when you own a lodge or a, a tourism operation. You've got to be so careful. <laughs> You've got to be so careful about making sure that guests don't feed them, and that you keep that barrier between humans and <clears throat> the monkeys, because they do have a lot of attitude, and they very quickly learn that we are not a threat, that we're slower than them, that we're frightened of them, and when that happens, they become a real dangerous menace. And because of that picture that you're seeing, that kind of uh, picture that they look so cute, they look so sweet, and all you want to do is cuddle them and give them a nice orange or a banana to eat, eh? uh -uh. they're not at all cute and cuddly. And it is no wonder that very few predators will take them on. And you hear these stories of really big sort of kind of farm dogs getting in a tangle with a monkey and coming off very second best. They're incredibly fast, uh, unbelievably strong for their size, and with very sharp little canine teeth. I mean, if you were to catch a monkey, for example, it would probably bite you and scratch you 20 times before you managed to hit it. Michael, your question sounds very interesting, so I'm going to ask for it again while we just drive along towards this um, jackalberry tree. Sorry, I missed it slightly. Ah. No, Michael, very nice one. You say every animal has its flight distance, its fight or flight distance, which is the distance uh, beyond which you cannot approach it uh, on foot with human beings. But does that vary from individual to individual within species? And the answer is absolutely, Michael, it does. And Gunuma and Quarantine, two wonderful examples of two male leopards 
that one of which was probably pretty comfortable for you to be right next to him on foot and the other was very uncomfortable with you being within sort of 20 or 30 meters of him. Those are the two that the, the two most obvious examples that I know of from here. Now as we grow up, what well, I'm really hoping that they spend a bit more time here, as Sean Gile and Hosanna grow up, you will notice immediately that there will be a difference. I don't know what it will be, but their tolerance of human beings will vary. And that will be down to their personalities, their individual personalities. Now there's a lovely picture here underneath this big jagalberi tree. Nyalas for days. Grey go away birds for days. Look how pretty Brian. Pretty light. And an impala up on the embankment. Ooh. It's quite vicious. There's headbutting going on with two cows. There are three species here now. There's also a diker underneath the tree. Obviously running away. Look at all these birds, the doves, and oh, you can't really see them at all. But I'll just tell you what's in the tree. I can see one or two, in fact, hundreds of gray go away birds. There are probably some starlings, a few hornbills. But they all, as soon as they descend onto the tree, they disappear into the foliage. Ah, now, Brian, I'm going to. Very good. I'm going to huck you slightly here. You know what these Nyala are eating? They're eating bones. Look at this. See? Chewing on the bones? Now that's not unusual, Well, but it just always looks so incongruous. They often do it at this time of the year, but whenever I see it, I'm just astounded by it. Just trying to suck out a bit of calcium and a bit of phosphorus. <laughs> I've also seen them sucking on tortoise shells, interestingly, for the same reason. It's almost always at this time of the year. Now, can you imagine what your digestive system would do if you walked up to one of those bones and started chewing on it? I think your digestive system would be deeply, deeply upset with you. I don't think it would cope at all. So lots of trace minerals, obviously, in the bones. And I think everybody thinks it's calcium largely that they're after, but I think, if you, I'm not mistaken, it's probably more the phosphorus. <laughs> and they're all doing it. Look, they are. Beautiful colours. There's three spots under the eye. The sort of a milky moustache around the nose there. I always think that's quite nice when we get these close-ups. It looks like they've got white lipstick on. Or perhaps they've got that sort of zinc sunscreen on, Brian. You know, like you used to wear when you were a very young teenager. I think this is quite special. Very nice, Mr. Nyala. I 
let's just go around the corner here. There are a few things sitting in the tree here. We we'll wonder if we can't get a better view of some of the other birds. There are they? Oh, a bit of a vertebrate there. Yes, that is amazing. All right, well, while we watch this Nyala having his... Uh, his bones for breakfast. Let's go to Brent. I'm not sure where he is at the moment and find out how his leopard track is going. We are deep inside Arethusa and uh, tracks of Tingana went across Triple M. So we're trying to see if we can find him or if someone else has found him, go visit him. So it'd be nice to see him. I haven't, oh, actually I did. I saw Tingana probably about 10 days ago. Uh, we found him from Impala alarm calling around the Balanites tree. Right, we're now right on the western edge of Arethusa, making our way down towards the Marikeni River system. And uh, I think Tingana is going to head into this area. Bobby, thanks. Confirm. I'm still first standby. I can make my way. Copy, thanks. Okay, so they found Tingana. Uh, good news. We are first standby. He's down in the Murakeni River, so we're going to loop de loop till we can uh, get in there. I have a tire paranoia now, since uh, we have no spare. I keep looking down every time I drive over a stick, hoping not to hear. Now it is a, a chilly, chilly morning. It doesn't seem to be getting warmer at all. And I've had to reinstate my, my blanket. And I enjoy watching Dave shiver behind me, because he's really tough. He didn't need a blanket today. Some lovely birdies. Oh, white helmet shrikes. Oh, there he goes. Oh, no, there's still one if we come out to the right. There. Well, there was one. <laughs> there go. White helmet shrikes, they disappeared. Now, even the birds are difficult to find on these windy mornings, they're quite flighty. But hopefully we can find some relaxed ones. I see some more birds up ahead. And where did they go now? Any vocal birds in the early morning normally? Oh, oh even the magpie shrikes. There we go. Here we go, magpie shrike. And you can see how the wind's flicking its lovely long tail about. So they live in flocks and they will heavily defend uh, their home range against other flocks of magpie shrikes, actually becoming quite violent. Guys, in search of insects. Now, like most of the, the shrike species, uh, if you look carefully in an area that they spend a lot of time, particularly on buffalo thorns and acacias, you can often find uh, their larder. So, a nickname for quite a few 
shrike species uh, many years ago. It's sort of changed now. Uh, specifically, the, the fiscal shrike was the Jackie Hangman. And uh, that's due to their habit, and a lot of the shrike species' habit, of impaling uh, creatures onto thorns. And it's not to make them suffer, it's to create a lighter. So if they fall, they'll store food on thorns. Uh, so the wind can't blow them away. And they'll actually defend those lighters against other birds. Okay, we're going to dive down towards the Murakan. No, don't run away! Right, where? Some warthog. <laughs> but they have disappeared at a rate of knots. Let's see. Oh, you can just make the ears out. There we go. There's the warthog. Very jumpy in this windy weather. Oh, right next to us. Not oh, right next to us. Not often they sit so nicely. Let me try it. go forward slightly. Is a, a southern black tit. There we go on that little dry acacia there. Zoom. Oh, there he goes. There we go. A southern black tit. Okay. Voracious insectivore. Very busy little birds. That's why they're quite difficult to get on camera because they're always hopping around and on the move. Now, Eddie was wondering, said, I thought snakes eat birds. Well, they do, but birds of prey also eat snakes. And Ellie is wondering whether if a bird of prey caught a snake and then suddenly became dinner. Well, Ellie, that's quite unlikely. Um, the snakes that eat birds generally eat quite small birds, and the only bird that's probably capable of eating uh, a big bird of prey would be a python. And the likelihood of them ever coming into a situation where they might cross paths is quite slim. All oh, those warthogs are on the run again. You just see the dust and bums disappearing into the distance. Be careful, warties. Tengana's around and you're one of his favorites. So we're going to start moving towards the Marakane River, where Tingana is apparently lying down. We are still first standby, but hopefully we won't be on standby for too much longer. still trying to figure out what's happening with the weather because there is this cloud bank moving in but it is breaking but there's still the strong wind that keeps pushing the cloud and I have to go have a look at some satellite photos after drive try see if I can guess what's going to happen to plan my wardrobe accordingly And Texas uh, said we had that dust storm yesterday and is wondering if we call dust storms habood like they do in North Africa. Well, maybe I think our dust storm is called a, a minor wind uh, from the dust storms of the Sahara. And I've actually never heard that word habood before uh, about the dust storms in uh, West Africa. But in West Africa, obviously, with the, uh, the Sahel zone and the Sahara, they're going to get much bigger dust storms. Standing by. Uh, road 7, uh, heading east. Kavi, thanks very much. 
Okay, so we are no longer standing by. We're going to make our way towards where Tingana is. Now you're apparently in the Marikini River, so what we're going to do is delve down into it. Whee! Okay, so while we head off to see the big dominant male leopard of this part of the world, uh, let's go see how James is faring back in the north. We're not in the north, everybody. We're in the deep south, and we're going towards the Hyena Den on Philemon's cut line for Sheila. Sheila, my grandmother's name, good name that. My late grandmother's name. Let's go and see what we can find there. Since we last saw you, we saw our two friends from uh, um, our two viewers who've been staying at Voyatella. It was lovely to see them. Um, I sh shouted at them for not finding us another leopard and they apologized profusely for not finding us another leopard and said that they would get onto it immediately. And so with any luck, we'll have a leopard fairly soon. Curtis of e. Courtesy, not Curtis of e. That's not a word, is it, Brian? No, it's not. Curtis of e. No. Courtesy of two viewers who are out here enjoying a wonderful safari at Vuyatela. They're about to go and see Quarantine Male Leopard, just to make you leopard, uh, make you jealous. Uh, quarantine Male Leopard is on Torchwood, where we cannot go, but they of course can, because they're staying at Vuyatela. But that's okay, we're going to see Tingana. Not us, personally, but you will see him with Brent. Now the hyena den is just around the corner, and let's see if we can't find something there. Hello Maggie in Australia, what a very good question from you that I uh, could easily get into hot water if I don't answer it very carefully. Uh, you say, given what I said about monkeys, what is my opinion on them training capuchin monkeys for helping with the disabled? Is that, that's correct, is that the question? Right, um, I don't know, I don't know about that. I don't know anything about it at all. Safe to say that I don't personally have a problem with it. I, <laughs> here's where you get into hot water. I used to ride horses quite a lot. And we used to do riding for the disabled. And disabled, used, disabled people, mentally and physically disabled people, used to come to, um, to the stables and they would ride. And the effect that horses had on people with mental challenges or mental illnesses and mental disabilities was profound. I imagine that the training of these monkeys, the idea is to get the same kind of effect from it and so I don't really have an issue with it if, and here's the, here's the, big, um, here's the big caveat to that, if they are not taken from the wild, now I mean that's just a silly statement because they must have been taken from a wild eventually, but we know now that there are captive populations of these animals. Um, you find them in zoos. Uh, I don't think they've been quite domesticated. But if they are not being removed from the wild, if they're having a positive effect on people, and if something moved in the bushes here, I don't know what it was. If at the same time the wild populations of those animals are not being harmed, then I don't have an issue with it. That is just my opinion. I have no doubt there will be as thousands of different opinions on the whole matter. I don't know how it's done though and I've not read anything about it. I just know that horses and we know dogs, uh, but I mean, I've had specific experience of horses, their effect on human beings and with mental challenges, well, well it's incredible. It's incredible to behold. So, in in essence, I don't have an issue with it, Maggie. Thank you for a lovely question. Now, here we're at the... Woo! 
hyena den, which hasn't been visited for some time, clearly. Don't worry, Brian. I'll break this branch so it doesn't break your head. The top one you're going to have to get yourself. Uh. Okay. I don't really need these anymore. Oh, I see. And Maggie, you're talking about maybe that these capuchin monkeys are being trained to help physically disabled people. There's nothing at this den, everyone. Um, you know, as a, <laughs> as Louise is just saying to me, fetch mail, perhaps open jars, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, again, it depends entirely on the effect on the monkey, I guess. But I think that you'll find that they are not being removed from the wild to do this stuff. So perhaps it's okay, I don't know. There's definitely no activity going on at this den at all. But well worth coming to check, so we'll go to the next one, which is on Zoe's Road. We'll try, if we're not killed by this tree, Brian. Yes. No good to be killed by a tree. No. Ah! Ah! Are you alright? I'm alright. Stout fellow, well done. Ah, on we go. This used to be a very picturesque den, of course, when this knobthorn tree was standing, and then the elephants came and pushed it over, and now it's a bit of a slum, isn't it, Brian? It's no longer a salubrious neighbourhood. I do like the word salubrious. Now it is something of a slum, a ghost town. go and patrol the other one on Zoe's Road. I might also be sorely tempted while Brent is at the at Tingana to uh, just go and see if those cubs are still eating their buffalo. As I have failed to find any form of high profile animal today other than a hippo scoppering away into the bushes. Watch your head again, Brian. You are a very large fellow. Right. Uh, as I drag Brian through many more bushes, uh, let us go off to the west, where the great Tingana is feeding on his breakfast with Brent. Why, well, he's still looking for his breakfast. Uh, there he is lying up on the edge of the Murakani River. Oh, it's tired, kid. He's walked quite far. His tracks come in on Cheetah Cut Line, and he walked straight through the whole of Juma last night, and is now about three kilometers, no, not maybe not three, but two kilometers inside Arethusa. So he's on his patrols, scent marking, making sure there are no marauding males coming in. And he has some elephants behind him somewhere, breaking branches. Oh, it's a tired kitty. Now, I'm pretty sure he would have attempted to catch something in this weather last night, but obviously not successful. And we all do know Tingana does move during the day. So he might lie up here for a few hours and then get moving again. Now this is, for any new viewers, the dominant male leopard over Arethusa, the majority of Arethusa and Juma. And to the west of him is a big male called Anderson. And their boundary is not too far from here. And both of them tend to walk it, uh, scent mark it, and uh, they've sort of drawn their line in the sand, so to speak. And then to the north 
of Juma, there's a male leopard called Gajima. So those are the three dominant males we see in this area. Of course, down on Cheetah Plains, the dominant male is Shavambalan. So even though he is snoozing and not up to much, it's always really exciting to spend time with one of Africa's big cats. And I've been quite lucky this morning. We've had lion and leopard. So Andrew's wondering how much food does a leopard need to eat. A male leopard eats on average about, if you take all the kills for a month, on average about four kilograms. So just under 10 pounds of meat a day. And a female about three, so a little bit less. So about eight or nine pounds of meat a day. Of course there are lots of days that they don't eat anything. That's averaging out uh, their kills over an extended period. Now it's difficult to see whether he has eaten, whether he's full or hungry, while he is lying down like that. But remember, even if he has eaten, all the big cats are opportunists. So if something happens to stumble upon, he will definitely take advantage. And there are quite a few animals in this area. We've seen warthogs, impala not far away, in Yala. So Maybe his best strategy is to just sleep tight and wait for something to bump into him in this gusting wind. Oh, there we go. Oh, Anna Marie is wondering whether Mr. T still has a taste for art fog. I'm sure he does. If he happened to come across an art fog burrow that was in use, I'm sure he would definitely take advantage of that. Oh, there we go. You can see that wonderful big thick neck of an adult male leopard sporting his dew lap helps protect him when he's fighting with other leopards. But not too much to interest him at the moment. He's more content to have a nap. Now, uh, Eileen in Texas is wondering, do lions and leopards shed old cloth sheaths like domestic cats do? Well, Eileen, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to have to do some research on that for you. Um, but I'm pretty sure if domestic cats do, there's probably a strong likelihood that the big cats do. But as I said, I'm not going to lie to you and say for 100% that I know, because I don't. Now, he's an adult male leopard in his prime, and Jeremiah is wondering, how old is Tingana, 
if my memory serves me correct, he should be about eight or nine years old. Uh, one of our leopard experts out there, you can remind me please, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. How old is Tangana? I think he's about nine, which would mean he's in his prime. Male leopards are in their prime from about six uh, to, to 10, 11 years old. So they have a slightly longer reign at the top than male lions. And over their life, oh, what have you spotted, Mr. T? What has he spotted? He suddenly got very interest there. Now, Angel was wondering how long does a male leopard on average hold territory for? So, Angel, about seven years, sometimes as long as eight years, depending on the individual. And uh, it also just depends on the area as well and the other leopard densities around. But I think in this area, generally about seven to eight years uh, that they'll be on the top of their game, so to speak. I thought, I thought he might have heard something interesting. Well, a huge welcome to Potato Walrus, who's a, a new viewer, and uh, was wondering, do we respond to your comments? Can I see what you're saying? Well, I can't see what you're saying, but I can definitely respond to your comments. And how I do that is we have our directors uh, sitting in a final control room and uh, they have all the emails and the Twitters and all that stuff out and uh, they feed it through into my ear. And so we are able to take your questions. So yes, Safari Wal Walrus and a big welcome to Safari Live. Great to have you on the back of the world's biggest game drive vehicle. Oh, well, the leopard's gone to schnooze. But you never know what's going to happen out here. Uh, there could be an impala that stumbles into this sighting, makes up, he might grab it. He might sleep like this for the next six hours, like all big cats. Uh, leopards sleep quite a lot, probably about on average 18 hours a day, slightly less than a lion that sleeps on average about 20 hours a day. And he's chosen a good spot to rest up. And James Richard has a very funny comment. He says, uh, I'm completely happy with Tingana sneezing. A sleeping cat can't leave our traverse area. That is very true, true James. Um, for now, while he's snoozing, uh, we are probably about a kilometer and a half from the, the western boundary of Arethusa, where we were driving a bit earlier. So hopefully uh, he finds something within our traverse area that is good to eat. So we're going to sit here and see what plays out with Mr. T. While we do that, let's see how Mr. J is faring back on Juma. Hello, Sheila. We've just checked the hyena den on Zoe's Road and there was nothing there but a bone, a very old bone. All the entrances have been closed in by bushes and trees. Ooh. Here are tracks of the male lion that we saw at the Balanites tree yesterday evening. He's obviously gone down south over the boundary into Hoffman's to see what he can find there. We're now going to go back to that lion kill and see what's happening there, because I need to see lions. I haven't seen them today. 
and we only had, I thought, a very truncated sighting of them yesterday morning because there were lots of people who wanted to come into the sighting but they seem to have been left fairly sort of free today so that's good news so that will be our general modus operandi then just before I last saw you, you came to see us again there was a brown snake eagle flying around here but I think he's gone down he's found himself a snake to eat oh well I'm sure there'll be others, Brian. No, there he is. <laughs> ah, he's flying. Don't fly, bird. Watch as he turns, everyone. Watch underneath his wings there. There you go. Just that very obvious white colouring under the wings with the black. I'll show you a picture because the light is not great on him there. It's just hanging in the wind there. Uh. Mm -hmm. There it is. But what you were looking for, so that's him there, if he's sitting down, you can see that yellow eye quite clearly sometimes. He's got a fatter head than that. A very fat head, which is very obvious, and then the other thing that's obvious is, is that over there. When you see him fly, immediately you can see that it's particularly clear. So, that white underwing there, and the brown on the shoulders and the torso. So, that is the brown snake eagle. Very nice, thank you, Brian. I haven't seen one for a while. They're not migratory, so they are here all the time. Still no Wahlberg's eagle. So let's go along here. Hello, my budgie. My my budgie you want to know what qualifications you need to do the job that we do uh, my budgie it, well it's very different for Brian and I of course Brian's qualifications are learning on the job basically you're a 3d animator by trade and you've learned your filming your film work on the job um, some of our camera guys are formally trained in camera work but what Brian and and Dave and VM and Jean Dre and now Eggsy do is very very different from shooting documentary style because it's live which means that they don't frame in the same way they don't zoom in and out in the same way as you would so it's something that you have to learn while you do it here I mean so you can have a background in film but basically if you have an interest in cameras and a passion for being in the wild you can learn to do this job then um, doing what Brent and Jamie and I do well yeah, we all trained in a similar kind of fashion I suppose uh, and that was as guides as safari guides that's basically what we trained to do and that is a qualification that you could need I mean I, in terms of before we did that Brent uh, didn't go to university first he did all sorts of other things um, Jamie did law at Cambridge <laughs> I did a science degree, I did a biological degree, uh, but you don't, there are three completely different backgrounds, you don't need a degree to do this job at all, that's what we did, um, but you, you don't need one. And you can then do any number of training courses in South Africa, or Botswana or Zimbabwe, um, there are a lot of charlatans running courses for people from overseas who, you know, come out here for three or four weeks and they get what we call a, a level one guiding qualification. That makes you legal, it gives you a certificate that says you can sit in the car and you can drive it and you're unlikely to get anyone killed. But basically to do this job you have got to have experience. And especially to do the camera job, the job that we do here now, it really does help to have three or four years under your belt. Just because the amount of information that you need to, to get out, the conversations that you need to have are very difficult if you're an inexperienced guide. But so there's no 
in short, there's no fixed route to doing what we're doing. You've got to be legal, and then it's very much kind of a personality-driven thing. I hope that helps. Uh, Brent is still with Tingana. Let's go and have a look if he has deigned to raise his head to us. Well, he has not raised his head. He is still in the exact same position as when you were last with us, but we are hoping that something might wander on and wander in and cause him to spring into action. But what we can do is, and what I'm going to try to do shortly, is try get another view. Maybe we can have a good look at his beautiful visage. So let's have a look. Where can we go, Dave? I think we can try from the other side opposite him. And look at that. Start the car. Doesn't even raise his head. Holding on, Dave. OK, I think we're going to have to drop the aerial there as I reverse. OK. And you do the 29-point turn. And still not raised at all. Are we, Dave? It's amazing that these creatures often like to take us into some of the most challenging places. And he still hasn't lifted his head. Standing by. I affirm just me here, uh, more than welcome to come join. Uh, Marikeni Drive, uh, probably just about 200 meters to the east of the junction with Road 7. Okay, it looks like we have managed to extricate ourselves from that spot, so let's get stuck into the next one. Off of the way, white berry bush. Yes, I think that's a better view. What do you think, Dave? Much better. Lovely. There we go. Dave says lovely. Thank you for that, Dave. There we go. Hello, big boy. Oh, actually, now I can see a bit more of his belly. He does look like he has had a meal. Uh, not too hungry. It's possibly why he's not too worried about hunting about at the moment. Uh, thanks very much, Ellen. I was incorrect. Tingana is 10 years old, uh, not eight or nine as I presumed. So there we go, 10 years old. So still definitely in his prime. Oh, look at that sleepy kitty. Oh, look through there. I just heard something. Um, if you come the way you are, in there, a little bit to the right, a little bit more, yes, it disappeared. Oh, it's just gone behind. All right, just to come back to the right a bit more. So you see where this big marula is? So in there. I just heard some little scratching about a little bit to the right. You can hear that chick, 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 chick. There we go. It's a little family of crested Franklins. Now, Felicity, 
Epic, welcome to Safari Live, Felicity. Great to have you on the vehicle. Uh, Felicity is wondering, will leopards eat insects if there's nothing else available to eat? Uh, they do, Felicity, and uh, they actually quite like flying ants. And I've seen leopards sit over an emergence of flying ants and have a big feast. Now, of course, they are very, very high in protein. Uh, the alates, the future kings and queens of the termite world. I've also seen leopards eat grasshoppers occasionally. Uh, generally, a lot of the, the insects are eaten when they are cubs and when mom leaves them and they're busy playing around and chasing anything that moves. But an adult leopard only in dire circumstances or special circumstances like uh, a termite emergence will they eat insects. Mr. T is looking quite fit and healthy. Now, Angel's wondering, is Tingana in danger from any other predators while he's snoozing like that? Uh, yes and no. I mean, even though he's snoozing, if we watch his ears carefully, they're always on the move. So he is aware of what's going on around him. And uh, he will react and react very quickly if there's a sound that he thinks might be a potential threat and the joy of being a leopard is you are able to climb your way out of danger oh can hear the wind getting strong again You can see his, little, his ears constantly on the move. He's listening. I'm quite sure he's aware that there are elephants probably 100 meters from here. I can hear them breaking branches every now and then. Even in this strong wind, I'm quite sure he's aware of the crested Franklins scratching around in the leaf litter a couple of feet from him. And if there happen to be any potential prey moving into the area, I'm quite sure he'd become aware of that as well or potential threats. We're going to sit here and see what else Mr. T gets up to while we do that. James has got a fluffy little surprise. Well, I don't know how much of a surprise it is, everybody. I didn't tell you I was coming here. But here we are, the lions, and one of them is feeding. Well, one cub is feeding. Two lionesses are having something to eat. A nice breakfast for them of rotting buffalo carcass. Delicious, Brian, isn't it? Doesn't it make you s very hungry? It does. Mm. And that little cub getting right in on the action there. And then, off to the left-hand side here, sort of in front of us, we've got the rest of them. One, two, three, four, five. All the little cubs, and the two mums, and a big male. There, Fern, pull in. Hello Donny, you're wondering about our proximity to them and you say we get so close to them, do they ever get worked up by how close we get? Donny, they do. It's not that unusual some, for them to give us a little warning, which would be a little growl, but we watch their behavior very carefully, Donny, and then 
because they're so confident as lions, they generally don't react to us at all. Now, it's sometimes a little different with um, leopards. They will, if they feel uncomfortable, they'll get up and move away. And lions will often do the same sort of thing, but sometimes they give you a bit of a growl to say, you know, that's close enough. But, I mean, we've had situations recently, especially with the three youngest cubs here and their mother. And what they did was they would come right up close to the vehicle. And then the mum would get up and come and investigate what they were looking at. And she'd lie down within two or three feet of us. So, you know, they're so confident in their own ability and their own strength and in their own dominance that they don't tend to worry too much about our presence. But I mean, it does, I know, it seems totally incongruous, totally illogical. Alright, let's quickly go back to Tingana. I believe Brent might be <laughs> tired of watching the flat cat. And let's go and see. So he's popped his head up. Unfortunately, we're going to have to make space for other vehicles. But we will definitely come, or one of us will definitely come follow up on him on the sunset safari. Now, well, goodbye, the beautiful Mr. Tingana. There we go. One last beautiful screenshot for you. And we're going to make space. So let's go back to James and the wonderful Nkahuma Cubs. The Nkahuma Cubs are just playing in the wind. I'm sorry, I'm slightly distracted by a vulture that's coming in. I thought it wasn't a vulture for a second. I thought it was a gymnogene, but it is indeed a vulture. And that's why that lioness has got up. She's seen them circling now. And she's not going to tolerate them eating at the kill. <laughs> <laughs> it is so sweet. And the male fast asleep, of course. <laughs> His big fat belly. The mating pair, or the potentially mating pair, are off to the left-hand side. That's quite a fat belly there, Brian. An belly. It's an immense belly. And he's looking up now because of the vultures now starting to circle. Listen to the little ones having a fight. So then I think you're gonna to struggle to hear the cubs. As soon as we turn the microphone up everybody you're gonna hear roaring wind. I just have to tell you that the cubs are cubs are making that those beautiful little growling sounds that they make at each other, and they're already not that um, soft. Some of them are quite loud noises, and they get quite irritated with each other. Look at that picture you've got there. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Hello, mobile Paddy. You're wondering if there are any other male coalitions. Remember, we don't refer to the male uh, groups as prides, so there's coalitions. Oh, that's my, it's my favorite when they come and they play with the males. Mobile Paddy, you want to know if there are any male, male coalitions in the area that might be um, about to challenge or coming of age and able to challenge the Birmingham boys? Not that I know of, Mobile Paddy. There were those, um, what were they called, Brian? Those young males, it wasn't the sticks. It was the, not the Tsalala, that funny group, the Shimungwe Pride. Shimungwe's are three males, and they were around here. Um, they were around for a little while, and we thought maybe they might be sort of a challenge, but I suspect they've moved off. So, no, nothing around here at the moment. 
and you don't really want it to be you know what you want is new blood so eventually when the challenge does come what you want is for it to come from say the Kruger from another area completely <laughs> and there's also some dispute as to whether these are actually the Birmingham boys at all that dis dispute is being created by Kheri Kamacho who reckons that these are not the Birmingham Cubs that everyone thinks they were. It would not surprise me one tiny little bit to find that they weren't who we thought they were. It's almost impossible to keep track of male lions from the time they're born to the time they take over a territory. And I've watched countless lion documentaries where supposedly the male lions who take over an area are a specific set of cubs that have been watched. It was patently obvious that that just isn't the case. And Sandra, you're wondering why they called the Birmingham Ooh, the two lionesses are just having a little bit of a fight at the carcass there despite the fact that they can barely eat because they're so full. Sandra, they call the Birmingham boys because they come from a farm called Birmingham. And that farm called Birmingham is in the Timbervati, which is not too far from here. But in the Timbervati, they were born, apparently, to a litter part of what's known as the Birmingham Pride and Herbert actually spent quite a lot of time there and he actually, if these are the cubs that, that everyone thinks they are then Herbert knew them as tiny little babies when they were born there and if I'm not mistaken I think our very own Hayden Turner t coined the term the Birmingham Boys, didn't he, Brian? I think so. I think he did. The Birmingham Boys of course were a, a nasty gang uh, that operated in Birmingham in the United Kingdom and um, so it was quite an appropriate name for these gangsters. And Michael, you're wondering that if these females the new females here, if they um, grow to adulthood and independence within this pride, is there a chance that they could mate with their father? Yeah, absolutely. Happens a lot. Happens very often. And as you say, they're not very old at the moment. They're probably maybe five, maybe five and a half, these boys. And so for them, I mean, conceivably two and a half years from now, when these young cubs are ready to have their first litters, they could easily still be in power, the Birminghams. So it is entirely possible. Indeed, it is likely. Is it bad? No. Were it to happen again the next generation after that, would there be a problem? Yes, quite possibly. Happens all the time with lions. <coughs> quite possibly with leopards too. Oh, there's a lovely smell now coming out of the southeast, isn't there, Brian? Mmm. -hmm. Rotting buffalo just before breakfast. Enough to drive a man sal salivating with hunger. Hmm. I don't know, Bedros, you've got a very good question. You say, can the cubs tell... who their mother is, given that they cross suckle, do they just see any lioness as their mother? Um, I'm going to say I think they can tell, because lionesses can recognize each other, they recognize the difference between each other, I don't see why the cubs wouldn't recognize the difference. No, so, no I think that they, they recognize each other, absolutely they cross suckle, but they do recognize each other. I'm just going to move slightly. I think the site of the 
Well, I don't know. Let's go slightly forward, and then we'll go back. We'll go back towards the kill site. I just want to move here because we'll get a better view of the cubs, but we're not going to have such a good view of the kill. That's now behind the trees. Is it disastrous, Brian? Is it okay? Here comes one of the lionesses. One of the only non-lactating lionesses. That's amber eyes. <laughs> now watch this. Watch these little cubs. They might try and suckle on her. They were trying yesterday. <coughs> And she got very cross with them. <laughs> now everyone is very tired. Justin, you've obviously seen some video of lionesses picking cubs up um, by the scruff of the neck and you want to know how she does that without causing pain. Justin, I'm not convinced that she doesn't cause pain and I think it's that slight bit of pain that makes the cub go completely limp. So I think it probably does hurt a little bit but she doesn't break the skin. And she doesn't break the skin because it's that loose skin that you know um, you find on dogs and cats behind the head. And so she doesn't cause them any injury, but I'm not convinced that there isn't a slight bit of pain there. I mean, they're massive canine teeth that she's using to pick them up. Right, I'm going to try one more reposition for you. Just behind this bush and try not to make too much noise. How's that? Is that alright? Now the other lioness is coming in. Look at that wonderful lion affection taking place and that's how their bonds are reaffirmed. See that cub trying to suckle from amber eyes there? Who very clearly does not lactating. And here comes the other little cub. Say hello to Dad. <laughs> hello, Kolu. You're a new viewer and you live in Oregon, and it's great to have you with us. And you say, Can lions eat spoiled or rotting meat? They can, Kolu, and they do all the time. That buffalo carcass that we've been looking at is very smelly indeed, and it is rotting. But they've got very, very powerful stomach digestive enzymes, very acidic stomachs, and they're able to eat things that you and I struggle to smell, let alone eat. So they have no problem eating completely rotten and what we would describe as spoiled meat. Yeah, no problem at all. Hyenas even more so.
Well, another nice one from Oregon. Sally, you're wondering if I think that given how sort of she's reticent that mother of the youngest cubs has been about introducing them to the pride, do I think she'll go away again and have some alone time with the cubs um, now that she has been with Atakil with them and kind of introduced them to the pride? Sally, I'm going to say no, I don't think she will, but I'm not going to say it's impossible that she might. So she could easily decide to take them off and spend some, t <laughs> spend some time on her own with them. But I don't think it's going to happen, no. I don't know if you can hear them shouting. We're not going to turn the ambient mic up because the wind is too strong. But they are screaming at each at the mother, those little things. She's getting very irritated. It's no longer, it's no longer the sweetest sound in the world. It's starting already to get quite harsh. And thank you for your screenshots, everybody. It's lovely to have them. They're a great record. <laughs> They're all getting so cross. The male is almost looking resigned about the noise that he's having to cope with. One of them, Brian, if you go over to the, to the left there, has gone to the other male and to the unlactating mating female, or p potentially mating female. And he's tried to get some milk from there, and that has not worked out particularly well for him. But I think Brent is back on Juma. Let's go and find out where he is, and I think he'll probably say, uh, bid you a fond good morning. A fond farewell indeed. We're on the windswept clearings of quarantine, and what a wonderful sunrise for it's been. The weather has been a little bit trying, but no matter the weather, when the cats are out and about, lion and leopard this morning, and uh, as hopefully lion and leopard for the sunset safari well i think lion we've got in the bank uh, but we'll definitely go see if we can find mr t again hopefully queen karula makes another appearance well thank you very much uh, mobile paddy says the toughest thing about watching a safari live is a uh, dealing with the jealousy of someone who's got the best job in the world. Well, I agree, we do have fantastic jobs, and thanks very much for watching Mobile Paddy. And to the rest of you as well, thanks for joining us from Dangerous Day of the Objectified Dish. And myself, it's been splendid, and we'll see you again in a few short hours for the Sunset Safari. We haven't moved, the lions have moved slightly, but generally, the state of play is as follows. To the far left, a mating female, or possibly oestrous female, with her consort, who is far too tired to be wooing her with flowers or impala lilies, as was the case I explained to you earlier today. Then, moving on from them, we have, I think, two of the teddy bear cubs. They're the youngest ones. We have my, probably all three of them there actually lying next to each other. 
Unless they are my favourite. And then to the right of them slightly we've got two lionesses reaffirming their social bonds, saying sorry to each other for fighting over the meat despite the fact that there was enough for everybody. Sorry I shouted at you, sorry I hit you on the face, sorry I stuck my claw in your eye, no problem, we'll get over it. Now, one of them is Amber Eyes, she is not pregnant, and then to the right of that, the two, the three mothers, the three mothers there, and what is either an uncle or a father down below there, and in between them, the five slightly older cubs. Wonderful little scene. And Justin, you want to know when a meow becomes a roar. These cats never have a real meow. It just sounds a bit like a meow when they're younger. But it's really rasping when they're born. It's really quite a rasping sound, born of the fact that they do have what we call an elasticated hyoid apparatus. All you need to know about that is that the voice box shakes up and down where it doesn't in other cats. And that's why they have those rasping noises. He is very, very peaceful. That might be the fattest lion I've ever seen. Very peaceful little grooming scene. I think these chaps are going to sit here under this tree for the next little while, uh, possibly for the rest of the day. They'll definitely move off by the time the night comes, I think, and they'll go and see what else they can find as they patrol this incredible landscape. That is going to be it from us today, everyone. It's been a wonderful little drive with you. Thank you very much for coming along with us and for engaging us in such wonderful conversation as always. Thank you, Brian, Thank you and to your thick, uh, your thick tied thumb. Well done, thick tied thumb. Uh, to Louise in the final control and Rebecca as well. A great thanks to them. Also, Brent on the other vehicle with David back from leave looking holidayed and fresh. We'll see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Bye bye. <laughs>